How's everyone this morning? A bit fresh, a bit chilly, I believe, uh, according to one of the AccuWeathers, they said five degrees this morning. Uh, it wasn't quite that bad where we stay, but uh, it certainly is, uh, is fresh. I uh, got some pictures from, from my, my UK daughter, who's now in Sabi, and uh, pictures of them in the Kruger Park, and they're busy swimming in one of the swimming pools there, and uh, my, uh, my grandson here is like, how can you swim? It's the middle of winter. And my daughter says, what do you mean middle of winter? This is summer in the UK. It's wonderful here. What are you talking about? But um, exciting to have them in the country, and they'll be with us next week, so be sure to come and say hello. Um, before we start, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you, Lord, we can be here. We thank you, Lord, we can interact with each other. We can hear your awesome worship songs. We can uh, commune with each other. We can uh, hear your word. We can, we can make choices each and every day, Father, to follow you uh, or to follow ourselves. And uh, that's what we're going to look at today, different perspectives on what it means to follow you. I pray this morning, God, as we read your word, that we just get convicted that there is only one perspective, and it's yours. I pray, Father, that uh, you'll uplift us, your word will encourage us, uh, that we will leave just super excited to just be disciples in your kingdom. Father, we thank you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is part two of perspectives. Uh, last week, you know, we realized that when it comes to Christianity, there will always be two perspectives. There will be God's, and there will be ours. Um, except that God has always had the same vision and purpose for man from the beginning, namely that He created us, we commune with Him, we obey Him, expect obedience uh, from us since the days of Adam and Eve. Um, but since then, you know, in all these, uh, as we go through the Bible, we see that God has added the word if, if you want to. And, and really, it's become a choice for us. We can decide what we want to do, which is great. But what choices do we make? When we become a Christian, we actually choose to obey God and be obedient to Him. But the question that we raised last week is, what if you and I, we make the choice, we call ourselves Christians, and yet we have the perception in our own heads that we have this perfect relationship with God, and yet we are completely wrong. That's a scary thought. And today we're going to look at a church who had just that perception. So what could man's perspective on God be? Well, there was a church at the end of the first century, around about 1896 when this was uh, written. Um, in Revelations, there were seven letters written to churches. Uh, this is letter number seven to the church in Laodicea, written by John. But they are the words of Jesus. So let's start with Revelation 3, verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. It's always good to know and to kind of set a standard of what are we listening to. We always want to know that as a people. Is, can we believe who it is that we're listening to? And I think that's why this first line is written there. That, uh, yes, actually the ruler of God's creation is about to have a couple of words to say to this particular church. So now we are, amen, that sounds pretty legitimate to us, well, to me anyway. These are the credentials of whatever's following from now on. Uh, verse 15 says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold... I am about to spit you out of my mouth. That does not sound very complimentary. In fact, it sounds quite inflammatory. He says to the church in Laodicea that not only does he know their deeds, stuff that they're doing every day, he also recognizes that these particular deeds of theirs are lukewarm. I mean, I understand the term lukewarm. I'm a hot coffee drinker. I don't know if Many of you are. And I like iced coffee in summer. I don't like, I don't do lukewarm. If my coffee is lukewarm, I'm more than likely to go to the stove, put it in a pot, warm it, 
I'm not a microwave guy, in case you were wondering. I'm old style. Actually, we've, we've never bought a microwave ever, so just in case you're wondering. Surely, yes. <coughs> There, old, there are old-style people like us who still do it the old way, so we rank up the, uh, ramp up the gas and we put the pot on the stove. And I, anyway, I warm my coffee. Yeah, I like it hot. That's the point. Um, but Jesus isn't talking about coffee here. He's talking about the single most important condition a human can be in, and that's their spiritual condition. He says, either be cold or be hot, because I can work with cold, he says, and I can work with hot. I mean, that's where we want to head towards. Either side is clear, but don't be in the middle. What does it mean to be in the middle? Luckily, he keeps talking to the church. He says in Revelation 3, verse 17, first section, he says, You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. Let's stop there. He defines lukewarmness. He says, you say, you, the Laodiceans, say that your spiritual condition is linked to your wealth, and because you are rich, clearly your spiritual condition, according to you, excellent. Now I've got to stop and ask myself, have I connected my wealth to my spirituality? I don't think so. I hope not, but I have to ask the question, am I actually aware myself if I have or not? Am I aware of it? So let's ask the Laodiceans a question. When and how did you connect riches to spirituality? When did that happen? It obviously didn't happen over one day. It must have happened over a period of time that you've got to this point. You know, last week we looked at God's first relationship with man, and it was about, we looked at the garden, we looked at Adam and Eve, communing with him in the garden, obedience to him, working the garden, but not a word about riches or money or anything. Whenever God interacted with man to repeat this basic message, riches didn't enter into it. But maybe their logic went something like this. So, God wanted man to work the garden. Now, if we work really hard in the garden, we are likely, if God wants us to, to get rich. You can see how this could get confusing. Then getting rich must mean, because God wanted me to work the garden, and I really did a great job working it, and now I'm rich. So it must mean that my objective has been reached. My work in the garden is done because I'm rich, which is obviously what God wanted because he put me. And that maybe was what they thought. What you've got to remember is that this is a sermon about perceptions. And today we're looking at a church whose perception about the Christian life has been encapsulated in this sentence, in verse 17. Their view of spirituality had become, we are rich, we have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. So is being rich and not needing more money, is that a sin? No. They'd been around a while. They were comfortable with their church routines, doing the expected things. But the sin that Jesus points out here is that the church itself had connected their wealth to their spirituality. In their own minds, they were so rich spiritually that they did not see the need for Jesus. They had lost sight of him. So we've got to ask ourselves this, who gave them this advice? Last week, remember, we looked at that verse in Proverbs 12, verse 15, which said, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Clearly, if they had asked anyone, it was certainly not someone outside of their rich group. Have you discovered that if you've got a crowd around you and you all believe the same thing and you all ask advice from the same crowd, the advice always comes back the same, so you stay with the crowd because the advice, it's, it's like self-fulfilling. If they were given advice contrary to the direction, 
that they were following, they didn't take it. Because advice is just advice, isn't it? You can decide what to do with it. But the Bible's got this super descriptive verse in, in 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, which says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And you kind of think, wow, that, that seems to apply to the Laodiceans here. They kept gathering around them people. They asked the advice from, and they said what they wanted to hear. The church had stopped listening to sound doctrine and rather listened to the it's all about riches choir. They'd lost sight of how to keep their eyes fixed on Jesus. And we can keep asking this church questions. Was it the whole church? How long has this been going on? Have they been teaching this from the pulpit? Heaven forbid. Has anyone tried to help them? But here's the question that came to my mind when I read this. If they can get confused about riches and spirituality, what about me? What can I get confused about? Where can my perspective get skewed compared to God's perspective? I mean, they had less than 100 years between Jesus and where this letter was written to skew their perspective. I've had 2,000 years. I've had plenty of time to mess up how I view God's perspective. Where can I get confused? As it turns out, there are many ways. And it's not just about riches. If we just look at some of the very average day-to-day -day things that we as a congregation go through, what about Sunday services and family groups and midweeks and any church-organized event? I mean, the Bible says, don't be in the habit of missing church. The Bible says, seek the kingdom first. Some of the scriptures that I learned 30 years ago. So is this my highest priority, or do I say things like sport, or family, or holidays, or even how I'm feeling, they come first? What do I say compared to God's perspective? Or what about getting advice, for an example? We read that scripture. The way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Is getting advice normal for me? Or do I say, or do my deeds show, that it isn't? I pretty much carry on life talking to nobody, listening to nobody, because I believe my perspective is the same as God's. What about God's word? Do I have the attitude of David? In Psalm 119, verse 10, he says, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. What a great attitude. Or do I say and do my deeds show that my opinions actually rule my life? I think this and I think that. And there's seldom a reference to God's word in the way I live my Christian life. We can keep going. Pick something. Tithing. Do I follow what God teaches or do I say, oh, but it's optional. It's what I've left at the end of the month, if I feel like it. Surely it's not 10%. Well, have I actually read the scriptures and said, this is what I'm going to do. Regardless, or do I say something different? The other day we got with a couple and we spoke about our use of words. So let's look at that. How do I use my words? Is it like Ephesians 4.29 which says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Is that my perspective, because that's God's perspective? Or do I say, 
what I think you need to hear, in a way that I think you need to hear it, in a tone that I think you need to hear it in. Where can I have a skewed perspective in my Christian life? What can cause me to lose sight of Jesus? Let's look at verse 17 again. It says, you say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. And Jesus points out the problem in the very first two words. You say, my version of what I think constitutes a spiritual life. Man's perspective of what he knows for sure, he's convinced this is what God is looking for. And yet, he's wrong. Somewhere between Genesis and Revelation, the church had changed God's teaching. And they were not aware that they had done this. They had arrived at a spiritual destination of their own design. And that's a scary place to be. They had arrived at an end point. They considered it spiritual. Nothing else needed to be done. And yet, we know... The background is, Jesus started off and he set the scene and he says, this is a lukewarm church. He says, it's better actually not to know God because I'm going to spit you out. So clearly there's something wrong with this, you say. But Jesus is not finished. The rest of the verse says, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. That is a low point. I don't know when last someone has stood in front of you and said, here's where you're at. Their self-defined destination had left them completely exposed spiritually. What would we say as a church to this church? Oh, I don't know. You're going to keep reading scriptures. But at this point, I'd step back and think, you know, we've spoken about the garden a lot. That we're garden people. You know, God originally said, work the garden. And I like to imagine, in my own head, that we as a Christian community, we're working the garden. You've got our head gardener, that's God. We work the garden. There's no grandstands in the garden, are there? Because we're all working. There's not some workers and the rest are watching the workers. There's no grandstands in my head anyway. I think as I'm working this garden, there's windows. So there's people can see into the garden, but they're not in the garden, but they can see the garden people doing their garden work. There's also not doors in my version of the garden. So I've worked the garden a little bit. Now I'm going to go and outside to the world. Whew, relax. Do some world stuff. And then come back in and work the garden again. And then go outside. There's no doors. You're in the garden. You work the garden. You stay in the garden. That's what it is. Where do I grow? I don't grow outside of the garden. I grow in the garden. Now imagine there's a group of gardeners, little corner, and suddenly all they're growing is huge, big sunflowers. And we're like, Lord, chief gardener, according to our plan here, that does not look right. But you go to them and they say, man, aren't these sunflowers beautiful? Clearly, this is what God wants, because this is a beautiful flower. And the people looking in the windows at this beautiful flower are saying, wow, we love those big flowers. This must be what it's all about, growing these wonderfully, beautifully big flowers. And yet, they're completely wrong. They're not supposed to be beautiful, big sunflowers there. They're supposed to be something completely different. I like making word stories in my head to try and imagine stuff. Or, or, or let's think of it like a family. 
So I got married in 81. We had our two daughters in 84 and 86. And we were a family unit. My girls did not define family life. They didn't kind of in their first words say, Hey, Dad, here's a couple of thoughts on how to run the family. More milk, more cookies, <laughs> more chocolate. <laughs> no, Joan and I ran the family. We, the parents, we made the rule, and, w- and we expected obedience from them, didn't we? Because we knew what we needed, because we had the bigger picture. We knew the finances. We knew the, what the world looked like. We knew what to be careful of and how to do things. And being a part of our family was a privilege. But they didn't see it at the time. They had to obey. At home, when we worked, we worked together. We cleaned the dishes, we prepared food, we did homework. There were no grandstand kids in our house who watched the parents do everything and then said, hey, we'll help with the eating. We volunteer. And when you look around for the dishwashers, they're like, oh, they're in the grandstands again. That doesn't work. And when somebody joined the family, we had Joan's sister with us for a while, guess what? We sat with her and said, these are the rules. This is how this family works. This is okay, and that's not okay. It's like a family. You know, at one point, one of the kids... when they started working and getting an income, thought for themselves, don't know where they got this idea from, that all the money that they earned was theirs. What were they thinking? We let it go for a month or two just to kind of at least sink in. But we knew the talk was coming. So we sat down and we said, my sweetie, how's the job going? Lovely. All this money, all these plans. I said, that's nice. However, in this family, if you're going to earn a living, there's a couple of things that you need to pay for that we've been paying for forever. <laughs> and we have looked on this job of yours with great delight. And we've really tried to hold back a month or two, but we are not holding back any longer. The time has come, the war has said. The time has come that you need to pay a little bit of rent, maybe some food, maybe some, uh, definitely your cell phone bill. And she said, oh, of course. Oh, that's exactly what I was expecting. No, she didn't. She had a complete meltdown, and she ran to her boyfriend, and her boyfriend said, you're terrible parents. We love this boyfriend. No, he didn't say that. He said, of course your parents are right. Now she had nowhere to run. (laughs) So she came back and said, okay, (laughs) teach me financial management. That's my girl. That's how it works in the family. That's how it works in the garden. We help each other, we love each other, we guide each other, and in the kingdom, we only have God's perspective. But that's a problem with man's perspective. He doesn't determine what constitutes spirituality. I don't know where everyone is in all those areas that we touched. I certainly know that I didn't come to church every single day from day one. When we studied the Bible and uh, and John Muir said, hey, you've got to come to church now every day, seek the kingdom first. Uh, My first discussion with Joan was, oh, hang on, that interferes with tennis. How are we going to wangle this one? Okay, we'll go every second week. We'll play tennis one week and we'll go to church the next week. We've got to get there. Slowly. Have I tithed every single month since day one? No. I haven't. There's been tough times. 
There were times when the church helped me. I couldn't tithe, but those that could help, helped. You work towards it. You gain in conviction. You manage your finances to the point where you can now say, I can tithe every month. That's just what I do. You get there. You get help from people. See, God has a cure. And our work in the garden, as Christians, is to strive to listen to the chief gardener. What does he say? Revelation 3.18, he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Jesus says there are, a, there are ways to recover from your perspective of spirituality. You need to buy from him a number of things. Now, I looked at that word buy, and I said, what do you mean buy? Everything from God is free. What do you mean buy? Well, we, what is free, God's grace is free, His kindness, His mercy, the Spirit, all these things for free. But this stuff, we've got to buy. How do we buy it? Through repentance. The effort of repentance. The Bible says, be earnest and repent. He says there's three things. Gold refined in the fire, white clothes to wear, self to put on my eyes. What does that mean? It will require some heat. See, when our perception of spirituality differs from God's, it means we have to fight to get God's perspective back. We have allowed, you know when gold gets, well, first mined and then it goes through a refining process. The stuff that comes off it is called dross. It's the dregs and scum of everything that's not gold, other heavy metals. That's the worldly thinking that's mixed in with the gold that I used to have. It needs to be refined and heated up so it, God's word, God's perspective is drawn out again so that I can see more clearly. Refine, refine, refine. The chances are that we're not seeing as well as we should. We need salve. You know, and, and when I was going through this, I remember one of Vanna's favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 3.16. But when anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Isn't that what it is? We, we've got this veil in front of us, and we are seeing our perspective more than God. But we turn to God, that veil is taken away. This, the reason Jesus used the word salve is that Laodicea was well known for the eye cream that they had. He's connecting with who they are as a people. Talk to people. Get advice. Be open to hearing that we are less than perfect. It's okay. We need to solve. We need to hear things. Jesus says we may be naked. How is that? Well, Galatians 3.26 says, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you, who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. You were clothed with Christ at the beginning. And to the church, he's saying here, you are naked. That clothing is not around you anymore. You need to be clothed in Christ again. Our behavior in that area of our spiritual lives, where your perception has replaced God's, has made you Naked. No more clothes. Is it easy? No. Christian life was never meant to be easy or comfortable. It's just that what happens is our human nature drifts towards ease and comfort. We are, that's just how we are built. It's kind of unfair. But I find if I fall short in certain areas of my life, does it mean that Jesus loves me less? Sometimes we think we have to be perfect, otherwise Jesus doesn't love us. And yet if you look at what I'm going to read now, you'll realize Jesus loves it more when you come to your senses and turn back to him. Revelation 3.19 says, Those whom I love... I rebuke 
and discipline. So be earnest and repent. It's again a perspective in our head that we get wrong. We think we have to come across as perfect Christians. But God says, no. What you must recognize is and become aware of is that there are areas in your life that you are less than perfect, and that's okay. Just be aware of it. Be okay with a rebuke and a discipline, and be earnest and repent. That's what I love. Had Jesus left the Laodicean church? Well, yes and no. In our last verse here, Revelation 3.20, the Bible reads, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Had Jesus left? Well, yes. But he was just outside the door and he was saying, Guys, I'm here. Just become more self-aware. Recognize those areas where your perspective has taken over and turn back to God. Be refined. Put some salve on the eyes. Get clothed again. And I'll be with you. To the one who is victorious. That's the victorious one. He's standing just outside the door, available to those who allow him back in again. By being earnest, repenting, and showing through their deeds that they had returned back to God's perspective. So, to summary, uh, we can say that the Laodiceans' faith had evaporated as they took the eyes of Jesus and allowed materialism to become their religion. We also have areas in our spiritual lives where our perception of the truth has replaced God's perception. How do we solve it? Read. Talk to people. Get advice. Be open to hearing that you and me are less than perfect. That's what Jesus loves. Put our hand up and say, I want to be earnest and repent. Because at the end of the day, there is only one perspective, and that is God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much, Lord, that you keep bringing us back. You know that we are a people that wander away from you just because that's our human nature. I pray, God, that we will never in our hearts think that we have arrived at some or other spiritual destination, some or other perfect condition that we cannot be moved from. Help us to see ourselves clearly, Father, in all those areas of our Christian lives, that we live, Father. Help us to see ourselves in the garden, just wanting to work with each other to tend your garden according to what you want us to do. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the people around us. We thank you that, Father, you've always given us the opportunity to turn back to you, to be earnest and repent, and that you're standing at that door and just waiting for us to come, uh, waiting for us to let you in. We thank you, Father, for all these things. I pray that you'll just convict us and help us and guide us Uh, As you say, you're always with us to the end of the age. We thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.